one to be practiced. <laughs> um, let's open our Bibles in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, if you have one before you, it would be helpful. 1 Kings chapter 18 on page 229. And I'd like to uh, focus our attention this morning on verse uh, 3, if we can, although we'll be looking at the, the whole of the passage. In verse 3, we read, And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. <coughs> Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Up until now, in our studies in the, the life of Elijah, uh, God has been preparing his servant Really, you could say that the whole of chapter 7 has really been for Elijah's benefit. Um, he's got a great work ahead of him. God has got some uh, mighty work and a job for him to do. Uh, but before he can do it, he, God, as it were, sets him aside in chapter 17. And uh, he needs to learn certain lessons. And so God, as it were, sends him to the school of hard knocks. Uh, as we've uh, seen in those in that that chapter, first of all at Cherith, and then with the widow of Zarephath, someone has said the church today is seeking great methods, but God is seeking great men, and that's so true. Elijah was just such a man. And God, here in the first chapter of his life, here in chapter 17, is preparing him uh, and making him into this great servant of his. And now, in chapter 18, the preparation is almost over. If you compare chapter 17 and verse 3 with 18 verse 1, you'll see what I mean. In verse 3... The Lord says to Elijah, depart from here and turn eastwards and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. So in chapter 17, he says, go and hide yourself. But now in chapter 18 and verse 1, you notice there's a complete change. Because he says there in verse 1, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go Show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So in chapter 17, he says, go hide yourself. Now in chapter 18, he says, go show yourself. So the moment has almost arrived. Now I say almost, because there's one more lesson that Elijah needs to learn before he confronts Ahab and before he engages in the ministry and the work that God has called him to do. And that lesson, if I can put it this way, is to sum it up here in these, these verses. The lesson that he needs to learn is that God is able to keep his people even in the harshest of circumstances. That really is why Elijah, although he's told to go and show himself to Ahab, before he gets to Ahab, as it were, he meets this man, Obadiah. Surely that's no coincidence. It's no accident, is it? Um, you notice in verse 7 uh, of uh, chapter 18, we read, And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. Isn't it wonderful? As Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. Well, what a coincidence. What a happy coincidence, isn't it? That there, there's Obadiah on the way and Elijah's going to meet Ahab. And, and there, there's this man and there's this meeting between these, uh, these two men. But there, surely that's no coincidence at all, is it? Before Elijah can meet Ahab, he needs to meet Obadiah. There's something that he needs to learn here in this passage. There's something... Something going on. God is going to teach his servant something else before he engages in this tremendous work that he's 
that he's been given. And these verses, 1 to 16, uh, really they focus on this man, Obadiah. You notice how he's described there in verse 3. He uh, says, And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to view this man and to just spend a few moments this morning thinking about this encounter that Elijah was given with this godly man, this man who feared the Lord greatly. If we compare verse 7 and verse 17, you'll see why this encounter takes place. You notice how when Obadiah meets Elijah, at the end of verse 7 it says, Is it you, my Lord, Elijah? Obadiah sees him, he recognizes him, and he falls on his face before him. And he says, Is it you, my Lord, Elijah? But then you go over to verse 17, and when, we, when Ahab and Elijah come to their encounter, as it were, this is the greeting that we find there. Is it you, you troubler of Israel? Ahab, is it you, my lord, Elijah? Ahab, is it you, you troubler of Israel? In other words, what we see here is a, is a contrast, a comparison, if you like, between Obadiah and Ahab. And the contrast is, well, it couldn't be more stark, could it? Ahab, Obadiah comes as a pleasant surprise. This encounter is something that is is wonderful to contemplate. This man is over the household, we're told, of Ahab and Jezebel. In other words, he's living with the king and the queen. He's there in the palace and he's got all authority over the palace. He's over the household. You remember the story of, of Joseph in Potiphar's house, how he rose, as it were. He begins off being a slave, but he slowly rises to the top, as it were. And Potiphar realises he can't do without him. So he puts him over the whole household. Or you remember the story of Daniel in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Babylon. And he's given the highest place in all the land in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Well, it's the same here. This man, Obadiah, is over the household of this wicked king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. He's right there in the very palace of this ungodly king and queen. Right there you find this man who we are told fears the Lord greatly. That's meant to shock us. That's meant to come as a surprise to us. It's so surprising that the commentators, you know, they can't get around it and they try. They can't begin to understand why, how this man uh, Obadiah could possibly survive in the king's palace with Jezebel and, uh, and King Ahab. And they do all kinds of, well, uh, sort of mental gymnastics to try and get around it. And he's been called a compromiser and a coward and a collaborator and all kinds of things. But the word of God is clear. They should be done for libel, you know. Because the word of God is clear. This man's a hero. This man is a godly man. This man is someone who feared the Lord greatly. Even there in King Ahab's palace. Right in the very heart of enemy territory. This man is living a godly life. So what we have here in Obadiah is an unexpected example of outstanding godliness. And I want to just point out three things to you this morning from this passage as we consider something of this, this man over Dyer. I want to think first of all about the marrow, if I can put it that way, the marrow of his godliness. And then the measure of his godliness and then finally the miracle of it as well. So first of all, the marrow of his godliness. What do I mean by marrow? Well, quite simply, I just mean the, 
the essence of his godliness, the core, the very heart of his godliness. What is it? What is godliness? We talk about it all the time, but what is it really? The heart, the essence, the marrow of godliness. Well, it's there in verse 3, isn't it? We're told, he feared the Lord greatly. He feared the Lord. Now, whenever we speak about the fear of the Lord, um, we immediately want to point out that uh, it's not the same as being afraid. The preachers will do that all the time. And there's an element of truth in it. I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you've ever really been afraid. I mean, really afraid. We don't really experience it that very, very often, do we? I remember, if I can just use a, a, a personal ex example, an illustration, really. I remember when I was just converted. I'd only been converted in a matter of months. Uh, I was just 19 years old. I'd started to drive and uh, uh, going over to the church in rugby. And uh, I just wanted everybody to know. I wanted everybody to know that I was a Christian. And I wanted everybody to come to church and everybody to hear the gospel and so on and so on. You know, I was just telling everybody. And uh, my best friend at work, uh, I knew him and I knew his family a little bit. I knew his sister. And so I, I invited his sister one evening to come to church. And so I went all the way to pick her up and it was out of the way. And I drove all the way to rugby and she sat under the ministry. And on the way back, we were talking about the gospel and so on. And we're trying to witness to her. And then we came to her home. And... Uh, she went a bit pale and she said, uh, my boyfriend's here. She could see his car parked at the road. So she said, uh, just stop here, drop me off. So, uh, I mean, I didn't even know there was a problem. But anyway, I, uh, I, I stopped the car and I, I, I dropped her off and uh, she went home and I drove off to my home. Now, all the way home, I was convinced somebody was following me. And I drove as fast as I possibly could. <laughs> and I got home and I got out of the car and I locked the car. And I went in the house and I locked all the doors and made sure all the windows were closed. And I even closed the curtains and in the car, in the kitchen, we had one of those blinds. You pull it down like that. I pulled the blinds down and I thought, wow, I can relax. I can. And so I started to just relax. And I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but you know that blind that I pulled down? It wasn't, it wasn't quite on the catch properly. <laughs> And so just moments afterwards, when I was starting to relax, this blind just went, <laughs> and uh, I, oh, I just, my, I, oh, my heart, you can imagine. Now, I've got to admit, I was scared stiff. I was really, really afraid on that, in, that, in that moment. And we don't, we don't experience fear really, like that, very often, do we? And we're very quick, aren't we, to say, well, it's not fear like that. When it says that Obadiah feared the Lord, it's not fear like that, and that's true. But sometimes, you know, I wonder whether we're not too quick to assure ourselves that that is not the kind of fear we're talking about. Yes, we are talking about a fear of reverence and awe. We are talking about a, a healthy fear. But listen to something that Matthew Henry said. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, said, True Israelites tremble when God is angry. And God is angry now in this passage. God is pouring out his wrath upon the land, isn't he? That's why he's told Elijah to go and confront Ahab and say, at my words, and not a moment before, will you see any more rain? And for three and a half years, there's no rain upon the land. And for all of those years, can you, can you just imagine what was going on? There's no word of God, so there's no rain, and there's no crops, there's no life. Everything's dying. The land is dying. And it's as if as though, it's as, almost as though the Lord is saying to Israel and to Ahab at that time, you want to live without me? Well, you go ahead and see where it gets you there. You carry on and see what happens. 
Now that's what Obadiah was experiencing and all Israel with him at this time. God, in the words of the New Testament, in Romans chapter 1, you remember, God was giving them over. He was giving them over to what they were wanting, really, by their sin and their, their waywardness. He said, go ahead then. You want to live without me? You want to turn your back upon the God of, uh, of Israel? Well, see what happens. And, God, and, and Obadiah and all of Israel with him was learning that God is not a God to be trifled with. He's not a God that you can play fast and loose with, is he? He is awful in holiness. And Obadiah knew it. The Bible tells us that our God is a consuming fire. And we think, yeah, Old Testament stuff. And of course, it's all different in the new, isn't it? But that statement is in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, the writer there it says, Our God is a consuming fire. And what a picture that is, isn't it? A consuming fire. We, uh, we teach our children to have a, a right attitude towards fire, don't we? We want them to fear, to a point, don't we? That's not being cruel, that's not do, being harsh or trying to scare them, of course, is it? It's something that is good for them. You don't play with fire. And yet, at the same time, we all recognise, do we not, that there is something very alluring about fire. We like it, don't we? There's something fascinating about it. If you've got an open fire in your home, there's something, isn't there? You can sit there, you don't need the telly on, you can just sit there and watch the flames, can't you? There's something really alluring, there's something really attractive, there's, there's something very attractive about, about fire. That's you know why we gather around bonfires on November the 5th and we all stand there with our faces toward, even though we're feeling it almost burning off, you know, backing off a little bit, but we just want to be there, don't we? There's, there's something about fire, isn't there? Now, if I can put it this way, that's what godliness consists of. This fear of God, that's the heart, really, of godliness. This is the marrow of the matter. Yes, it's awe and reverence and fear. And yet, it is not a fear that repels, but a fear that attracts. It's a fear that draws us towards him. The godliness, the fear of the Lord, as we're seeing it in Obadiah, really, if I can put it this way, it's, it's like living every day in the knowledge that we stand in the presence of one who is so holy. That's... Obadiah. He's more afraid of God's frown than he is of Ahab's fury. And that's a real challenge to us, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, we can use, well, we can say things like, uh, as Christians, we can say, uh, well, you know, uh, I'd be more godly, I'd be more committed, perhaps, if my circumstances were different, you, don't, you just don't understand, Trev. You don't understand what I'm going through, maybe. You, if you just knew the, the terrible circumstances that I go through and, and have to live with, well, you'd, you'd, you'd see, you'd understand. Well, that's true, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, I have to wonder whether they're not just excuses. You see, a, a, a Obadiah is a God-fearing man there, right in Ahab's court. Spurgeon put it this way. He said, any weed can grow in a greenhouse, but God can make orchids grow in the desert. That's a wonderful picture. That's Obadiah. He's a desert orchid, isn't he? 
is a, and a wonderful and surprising example of outstanding godliness in an unexpected place. That's the marrow of his godliness. So let's think then a little bit about the measure of his godliness. He says in verse 3 that he feared the Lord greatly. He fears the Lord greatly. That's a tremendous thing to say about this man, isn't it? That's, uh, that's God's assessment. I think that's Jeremiah writing. Most probably Jeremiah wrote this book. And that's what Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says about this man, Obadiah. He feared the Lord greatly. What does that mean? What does it mean to fear the Lord greatly? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, this was the mark of his life. This was the one thing that he was known for. He was not content to be Mr. Average Christian. He was not content to simply drift through his, his Christian life, if I can say that. Uh, he wasn't content to just drift through his Christian life, simply getting away with the name. He's not interested in nominal Christianity, in other words. This man feared the Lord greatly. The attitude that we so sadly see in, in evangelicalism today is completely absent in him. The attitude which says, well, I'm a believer, aren't I? Next stop, heaven. Why do I have to do anything more? Surely I'm a believer, aren't I? I put my hand up in a meeting. I signed a card, maybe. I, I, I professed faith and so on. But don't expect me to do anything more. You know, it's not. No, that, that's not the attitude of this man. He feared the Lord greatly. Robert Murray McShane was a an amazing pastor and preacher, Scottish preacher, and he died when he was only 29 years old. But already the Lord had used him tremendously in the ministry to save many, and the, he could still get his writings and so on, his sermons and so on. He, he used to pray this. Lord, he said, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be this side of heaven. That's Obadiah. Lord, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be this side of heaven. Not, well, I'll see what I can get away with. You know, not, uh, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, don't expect anything more. No, he wants to be as godly as he possibly can be. He fears the Lord greatly. It's like the Apostle Paul, isn't it? In the New Testament, you remember in those words in Philippians chapter 3. Let me just read a few verses from that chapter, Philippians 3. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind and straining forwards to what is it, what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, he says. That's the Apostle Paul. When did he write that? He wrote it towards the end of his life. He'd been a believer for 30 odd years by that time. And it's quite incredible what he says. As he's getting older and as he's even now in prison in Philippi, in, in Rome, writing to the Philippians, as he's writing this, he, uh, you know, awaiting the, the death penalty. And uh, you'd think he'd say, well, you know, I've done more than anyone else anyway. Time to put my feet up, take it easy. I'm going uh, to just sort of sail on. Sail on in for the rest of the rest of my time. No, he says, forgetting what lies behind, my successes and all my failures, forget it all. I press on to win the prize. That's a challenge, isn't it? That's Obadiah. No, we don't know how old Obadiah was in this passage, but he's got the top job in the land. He couldn't get any higher, so I doubt very much he's a novice. Seems as though this man has been around a while. He's seen a few things, perhaps. And he says in this passage that he feared the Lord from his youth. 
And yet now he's not, e not easing off, is he? He's not looking to retire spiritually. He's not saying, no, well, I think I've earned it, you know, I can put my feet up now. Even now he's faithful in Ahab's courts. That's a great challenge for us. So let me ask you, <clears throat> do you fear the Lord greatly? Are you pressing on? Or are you just drifting along? Are you pressing on? You remember how Paul puts it in another passage in the New Testament? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, do not do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it, he says. So run that you may obtain it. We, uh, we teach the kids these days, uh, you know, a bit, uh, of, co of course we need to. You know, we, we, we sort of say in sports and things like that, well, you know, it's, it's not the winning that counts, it's the taking part. And, you know, if you're just taking part, that's, that's good, isn't it? Well, Paul says, not in the Christian life, it's not. It's not just taking part that matters. He says, you run so as to win the prize. That's the point, isn't it? And he uses this picture from the Olympics and uses the picture of an athlete in a race, going into training and doing everything they possibly can to win the gold. That's Paul's attitude in the Christian life, that's what he wants to see in us. Do you know what? I don't know if you watch uh, uh, the Tour de France or anything like that. Um, I'm going to confess something now because I don't understand it. I know they, you know, they race from the start to the finish and all that kind of thing, but there's these teams, isn't there? And they're, they're racing in a team, but really they're racing to support one man in that team and they want that one man to, to lead at the end and, and to win the race, don't they? And so there's a whole load of men in that team, really, that are training and racing and doing all they possibly can. But really, you know, right from the beginning, they've got no intention of going for gold. They, I, I think that's right. I think that's the way it is. Now, I don't get it. <laughs> Why would you go into all of that training if you know that you're not even expected to, to go for it? I don't know, it's just strange to me, but anyway. Um, but you see what Paul is saying? Run so as to win the race. May that be our attitude, brothers and sisters. To fear God greatly. Not just wanting to finish, but to win. To race as though we're the only one. That we're the only one in the race. Race for gold. Well, this is the measure of the godliness of Obadiah. What a, what a hero he is. And then finally, let me just say briefly something about the miracle of his godliness. The miracle of his godliness. As, as I mentioned earlier, the commentators really struggle to explain this man. They, they can't understand how Obadiah could possibly be a God-fearing man in such an ungodly place as the court of uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel in the passage, you know, uh, we, we read uh, of Jezebel and her attempt to stamp out all of the, the word of God. She tries to put to death all of the, uh, the prophets of the Lord and Obadiah saves a hundred of them, you know, uh, as we read there in the passage. How on earth did he survive? Well, they say he must have been a compromiser or something. He must have uh, just kept it all quiet to himself. But that's not, that's not to do, that doesn't do him justice, does it? How did Obadiah survive in such an unlikely place? How could this orchid grow in such a desert? Well, I think the explanation to that comes later on in the story. You remember how in chapter 19, verse 18, we read this just over the page. Chapter 19 and verse 18, it says, uh, well, Elijah has been saying, I'm the only one, Lord. You know, that's one of his complaints, isn't it? He's so depressed at this moment, and he says, I'm the only one. There's no one left, there's just me. And then God says to him in verse 18, Yet I will leave, or have left, 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 
you know, there's, there's the answer, really. Um, Paul, in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, picks this up. In chapter 11 of Romans, don't need to turn there. Let, let me just read a couple of verses uh, from that chapter. But he picks this story up in chapter 11 of Romans. And he says this. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal. I have kept. There's the answer, isn't it? How did Obadiah survive in such an ungodly place? He was kept. God was keeping this man. This is the miracle of his godliness, isn't it? Because godliness doesn't come naturally to any of us. It's not something we're born with, is it? By nature, we're all at enmity with God. And every single one of us, really, by nature, we're all in Ahab's kingdom, aren't we? We're all just like him. None of us, by nature, are like Obadiah. And yet here we have this wonderful contrast. Contrast, well, how did it happen? God is mighty to save and he's mighty to keep his people, isn't he? What an encouragement that is to us then. This man's called Obadiah. What does Obadiah mean? Well, in Hebrew, it means servant of Jehovah. Servant of Jehovah. Where did he get that name? Where? Surely his parents gave it to him, didn't he? Didn't they? What? He had godly parents as well. In Israel, in a time like this of terrible spiritual decline, the whole nation is full of idolatry. And yet here's this, these parents of Obadiah and these, this boy is born and they call him the servant of Jehovah. I think this is incredible, you know. What a miracle of grace. What a miracle of the power of God to keep his servants in the most unlikely of places. Someone has said of this time that it was as if Satan had left hell and come to live in Samaria. It was as bad as that. And oh, how his parents must have prayed for Obadiah, don't you think? Oh, how they must have longed that their boy would be a God-fearing boy. And that he would remain faithful to the, to the Lord throughout his life look at him he says i feared the lord greatly from my youth and now here he is still faithful at this time as well that ought to encourage us you know to press on it ought to encourage us to press on praying for our children for our loved ones for those who are still outside of the kingdom of grace. It ought to encourage us to press on. If we've got young children to keep on teaching them. And bringing them up in the admonition of the Lord. It ought to encourage us to pray on. If our children are grown up. And perhaps left home. And to maybe, you know, sometimes it almost seems as though they're, they're more like Ahab than Obadiah. Even though they've been brought up in Christian homes. Isn't that true? They, they, can, they can seem so far away from God and godliness. They can be such aliens to these things. But you know there's hope, isn't there? There wasn't hope for this over Ahab. But there's hope for Ahab's today. There's hope even for, do you remember Manasseh? Manasseh, one of, the, one of the kings of Israel, later on in the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, we read these words, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. It says this, he was a, a wicked man who even sacrificed his own children. And yet it says this, and when he was in distress, he entreated the favour of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. 
He prayed to him and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Oh, the mercy of our God. This man who had lived such an ungodly life turns to the Lord and calls upon the name of the Lord and the Lord turns and has mercy upon him and saves him. He can save the worst of sinners. Our God is able, he is mighty to keep his people and to save sinners from the kingdom of darkness. So don't give up, will you? Don't give up on your loved ones. Don't stop praying. Perhaps they may seem a million miles away, but don't stop praying. Don't stop, don't give up on them because the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. They've just got to call, turn to the Lord and call upon his name. And if you think, well, I've listened to all of that, but I, you know, I think I'm in Ahab's kingdom. I'm more like him than Obadiah. Call upon the name of the Lord even today and you too will be saved. Let's pray. Amen. <laughs>